Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, just how are the midterms going to affect the farm economy and thus the rest of the country? A unique partnered approach to funding and building means pest control applicators will get the training they need. It may be cold, but you can still have color in your landscape. And Zach Ashmore takes us off the highway to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. In our Farm Week Newswire, lots to catch up on. The Farm Bill is getting a lot of attention. More on that shortly. Lawmakers had hoped to pass a new version before the current Farm Bill expired at the end of September. Now they say January is their goal. One hurdle in the way, Congress still needs to find money to run the government by December 7th. Meanwhile, Farm Bill negotiators still close to, still nose to nose on SNAP work requirements. NAFTA 2.0, now known as USMCA, still has to be approved by Congress sometime in 2019. But since the midterm elections, a power shift seems to be getting in the way. Progressives say some of the labor provisions in the new agreement leave little room for enforcement. Meanwhile, the elections say Politico. So a lot, some lawmakers are still on the fence about the new trade deal. The U.S. trade war with China may be opening doors for other countries. Canada's trade minister says his country is looking to possible trade deals with Beijing. The U.S. has been locked in a tariff war with China and says China must drop its tactics on intellectual property before the U.S. backs off. Lawmakers are still talking about line speeds in meat packing plants. Poultry plants are asking the USDA to lift its speed limit of 140 chickens per minute. That follows the move to remove limits on pork line speeds. Those who oppose the move say faster speeds will likely lead to more worker injuries. And the USDA also says there will soon be another round of aid for U.S. producers hit hard by retaliatory tariffs. Last week on Farm Week, we talked to dairy farmers in New York who, like most small dairy producers, have been hit especially hard. That announcement is scheduled for December 3rd. We'll follow up. And speaking of the midterms, the outcome of those elections has more riding on it than just pre uh, representation in your local legislature or in the halls of Congress. Some of the voting results are expected to have a far-reaching impact on the farm economy. Here's Peter Tubbs with that story. Democrats won at least 30 congressional seats from Republicans in midterm elections Tuesday, giving the minority party control of the House in the coming 2019 congressional session. New members of the 116th Congress will be sworn in on January 3rd, and the change in leadership will have a ripple effect on Washington policy that shapes life in rural America. The long-debated 2018 Farm Bill may see a quick finish in the approaching lame duck session of Congress, which begins November 13th. Republicans in both the House and Senate had been working on increasing work requirements for Americans who receive SNAP benefits, but they may abandon the proposal in order to finish before the current session ends on December 14th. Colin Peterson, a Democrat from Minnesota who is expected to become chair of the House Agriculture Committee, has shown support for the Senate's version of the Farm Bill. Peterson has stated he has little desire to start over on the multi-billion dollar piece of legislation. The newly minted USMCA trade pact may become a point of conflict between the executive and legislative branches. The agreement has to be approved by Congress, and House Democrats may ask for new language on a variety of issues, including improved labor standards in Mexico. If the White House were to withdraw from NAFTA, negotiators would only have six months to settle any differences Congress has with the new trade deal. While USMCA waits for congressional approval and a presidential signature, the terms of NAFTA remain in effect. California voters approved a measure that may have an impact on agriculture beyond the state's borders. Proposition 12, which mandates any product from a chicken, laying hen, or pig that is sold in California must come from animals raised with minimum space requirements. The controversial measure was approved by over 60% of voters. 
the agriculture industry warned the new housing mandates would raise prices for both producers and consumers. Others express concern that the mandate could drive small and medium-sized producers out of business. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. No matter whether you live on a farm or in a town, termites can be a serious threat to the structure you live in or have a business in. Mississippi's first facility to help train the men and women on the front lines of battling the wood eaters is now nearing completion on the Mississippi State campus in Starkville. This is an update to a story we first brought you back in April. Management team members from a pest control company look over some of the completed workstations in the new termite technician training facility known as T3F. It almost looks like a showroom of building foundations. Mississippi State Extension will use this facility to teach pest control technicians how to treat termite infestations in all types of structures. The notion is that we would provide um, uh, tentative uh, termite uh, applicators, uh, technicians, um, uh, the understanding of, of how these things are constructed so they'll know how to go about measuring and providing for treatment. The Pest Control Association originated the idea for the training facility. Extension then worked with the MSU Foundation to generate private donations from association members to build T3F. We had a number in mind that we needed to, to get to to uh, be able to fund um, this facility, uh, the training stations uh, within it, and we started out uh, within the state and uh, a lot of the industry, uh, termite industry, stepped up. Competitors all around the state uh, really uh, unified and came together. The latest private donation for T3F came from Gordon Red Jr. of Gulfport. The training facility will bear his company's name. In the past, we've, we've learned a lot of things through textbooks, through visuals, through videos. But to be able to do something hands-on gives, gives a person that talent, true talent. They can have the understanding, but, but this helps them get that talent. It helps them to structure a solution for someone to solve their termite control. The first official training in the new facility is expected to begin in the fall of 2019. The USDA and pest control company Orkin estimate that termites cause about $30 billion in damage to crops a year. They say that Americans spend about $5 billion a year controlling termites and repairing damage. So the opening of a training facility like T3F comes at a very good time. On the gardening side, if you're looking for a pollinator magnet that produces color deep into the fall, look no further. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Gary Bachman tells us about one of his favorites, fall salvia. Gardeners who follow Southern Gardening know that I'm a real fan of salvia. Let's take a look at a few new introductions that I think are still looking good in the fall landscape. How can you beat salvia for its ability to be a showstopper and pollinator attractor? And in the fall season, salvia really shines. At Truck Crops, they're growing three salvia selections you need in your garden. Pollinators simply adore these plants. Rock and Deep Purple displays richly colored dark purple flowers each with a black calyx and stems. I like the dark calyx because it maintains a color presence after the flowers have fallen off. Rock and Fuchsia produces showy, unique fuchsia colored flowers with black calyx and stems. These gorgeous colored plants are trouble free with no deadheading needed. Both Rock and Deep Purple and Fuchsia are sterile selections which will not set seed. That means these plants will be in continuous bloom all season. Rock and Golden Delicious Salvia is a real treat. The bright yellow foliage has a pleasant pineapple scent. This is an ideal heat tolerance selection and in the cooler temperatures of fall will produce bright fire engine red flowers. Regular watering and fertilizing will keep these plants rocking with maximum color, growth and performance. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Well, Christmas trees are beginning to show up everywhere, but not exactly a joyful mood in the markets. 
Certainly not, Mike. Tis the season, though. <laughs> Between now and uh, Thanksgiving, not a lot of incentive out there for prices to rally, so many market say many market veterans. Now, in the trade this week, a new report projects smaller than expected U.S. corn and bean crops. Export sales of U.S. cotton to China sink, but a seasonal bounce for the dairy markets may be shaping up. The USDA this month lowered its production outlook for both U.S. corn and U.S. soybeans. The November 8th report is projecting 1% fewer bushels of corn nationwide compared to the October figures and 2% fewer bushels of U.S. soybeans compared to a month ago. Mississippi yield and production estimates stayed the same. Extension's Josh Maples provides more information. How much of a surprise were the lower production numbers for corn and soybeans? It was a surprise. So pre-report expectations were actually expecting a little bit of an increase on average, uh, but both corn and soybean production numbers, U.S. production came in lower. On the soybean side, re um, reduced average yield to down to 52.1 bushels per acre. Uh, that's about a bushel lower than the October report. And uh, for corn, also reduced uh, expected bushels, average bushels per acre down to just under 179. And that was almost two bushels lower than the October report. So these were big factors in lowering the U.S. production expectations. And how are the markets reacting to these numbers? It's been a mixed reaction. This is a report where we see lower production numbers for the U.S., but we've seen some higher production or higher supply numbers, carry out numbers for the world. Uh, some of that's impacted by uh, some numbers from other countries. And so it's been a mixed reaction. Traders aren't real sure where to go with this. And uh, it's, it's been a, that, that's been the story the last couple of days since the report. Now, as for Mississippi corn and uh, soybean production numbers left unchanged, is that a surprise to you? Uh, not a huge surprise yet. You know, we've got most of our harvest is done, so we, we've kind of got a lot of information. We still do have some crop in the field right now, and so that could potentially adjust these numbers uh, depending on how that goes. So the weather could have brought a change. That would be the main factor there. Absolutely, yeah. It's been a pretty wet harvest season. And, uh, you know, we've still got some, some crops in the field, especially still got some beans in the field in parts of Mississippi. So as we do, and hopefully we do get all of that uh, harvested at some point, if those numbers come in lower than expected, that could adjust uh, that, that average yield number for the state. What's your uh, evaluation of how the soybean markets here as well as nationwide being impacted by the Chinese tariffs? So as far as prices go, it's certainly been negative. So the, the tariffs on U.S. soybeans entering China has led to lower soybean prices. A little bit confounded with that is that we've also got a really big soybean crop. So it's not fair to look at this year's prices versus last year's prices and say this is all due to the tariff. It's also a supply story. Export sales of U.S. cotton to China are down dramatically, as you might imagine, given their current trade standoff with the U.S. This month's updated balance sheet for cotton from the USDA shows lower exports in general and lower ending stocks of cotton. U.S. production this year, compared with October's projections, is also lower now. But Mississippi cotton yield and production is unchanged in this latest update. Trader Don Roos says the drop in U.S. exports and wet weather are two issues that trouble him most. We're very dependent on uh, China from an export standpoint. Actually, in the world, they kind of dominate what happens. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, it is an issue. You know, and the cotton market sank from uh, up around 90 down to around mm -hmm. 76, and I think that's part of the reason. We have some wet weather, some uh, weather issues. At first, it was too dry in the cotton, then too wet, so uh, quality down. But I think the feeling is acres could be up next year a bit. Time to move into our trivia quiz for this week, and here it is. Our topic is organic food. What is the top selling category of organic food in the nation's grocery stores this year? Is the answer A, dairy and eggs, B, meat, or C, vegetables and fruits? We'll have that answer coming up shortly. Well, time for a little break, but stay close. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, we're getting off the highway again with Zach Ashmore. This time he's headed to Vicksburg for a look-see at the first place in the world where Coca-Cola was ever bottled. It's a surprising story about the real thing. Also in Vicksburg, Zach tours Walnut Hills, an antebellum house home to authentic plantation cuisine. 
Come ride with us off the highway, coming up on Farm Week. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, the MSU Row Crop Short Course, December 3rd through the 5th at the Cotton Mill Conference Center in Starkville. This conference is packed with presentations on entomology, plant pathology, ag economics, and more. Registration is free before November 27th and includes all meals, snacks, and drinks. Full information online at extension.msstate.edu or call Kathy Johnson at 662-325-2701. Next, and you have plenty of time to register, let's go to New Orleans for CattleCon 19, January 30th through February 1st. This is the Cattle Industry Convention and Trade Show brought to you by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. More than 9,000 cattlemen and women will gather in the Crescent City. This one will be one of the largest on record. Three and a half days of education, fellowship, networking, and fun. For more information about CattleCon 19, visit online at beefusa.org. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. A smaller milking herd as time goes on is one of the positives for the U.S. dairy industry as this year winds down. Another is that it appears that a bottom is now in for fluid milk prices. Analyst Naomi Bloom has more on this sector. Exports overall for dairy for this year had actually been phenomenal, really quite phenomenal. So much of that has been factored in. And what we're dealing with more is just this glut of fluid milk that's mm -hmm. out there. So interestingly enough, though, we are actually starting to see cow slaughter numbers for the dairy market increase. And so the herd is slowly getting smaller. The other bit of good news is that now that the um, milk price is bottom, $15 is a big support area, this is the time of year that cheese demand starts to pick up, and so we've already started to see that. Uh, the block barrel price, $1.35, that's where Cheddar was holding all week, and so that was really important. We saw buyers step up. And so because of that, the milk futures started moving higher, and if we actually start to finally see smaller production now because the herd is getting smaller, I think that we've got our worst behind us for the moment, and then we can start to see the market move back up on a technical balance, but also a seasonal balance heading into the holiday season. Well, we're going to bounce out of the markets now with a trivia answer for this week. Our question again, what is the top selling category of organic food in the U.S.? The correct answer is C, vegetables and fruits. If you love traveling rural settings, this story's for you. Our second edition of a new segment here on Farm Week. In this episode, we head to Vicksburg, Mississippi for a soda pop and a trip to a pre-Civil War home that's now a haunted restaurant. Here's Zach Ashmore with Off the Highway. Welcome to Off the Highway, a show where we explore hidden gems all across the state of Mississippi that you ought to know about. I'm your host, Zach Ashmore, and today we're headed to the heart of Vicksburg, Mississippi to check out the Biedenharn Coca-Cola Museum and the Walnut Hills Restaurant. But first, we're going to meet up with Extension Agent Sandy Havard, and she's going to show us on our way. Miss Sandy Havard, you are the extension agent for Warren County. Tell me, what do you like so much about Warren County and the people of Vicksburg in particular? Well, I really love the people here. Um, they are really great to work with. Um, we have a rich history and culture in Vicksburg, and we have some of the best attractions in the state. 
And that includes what we're, where we're at now, the Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum. That's exactly right. The Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum is one of the many attractions here. Miss Nancy Bell runs the museum and we're gonna go meet her right now. Miss Nancy Bell, we are here at the Biedenhorn Coca-Cola Museum here in Vicksburg, Mississippi. What's the history of this place? This is where Coca-Cola was first bottled anywhere in the world in 1894. So this building was built by the Biedenhorns in 1890. Before they started bottling it, they had it as a syrup. It was made in Atlanta, Georgia, 1886 by a pharmacist, but it was only sold at soda fountains. Mr. Biedenhorn, being one of those, would have it in his soda fountain along with, a lot of times, hundreds of flavors. So people come in, they get a Coca-Cola, but they couldn't take it with them. You even left the glass. They liked it a lot better than they liked um, his flavor, and so they asked, a no number of people asked, you know, can't we get Coca-Cola to take with us? Why is it we can only get it here as a glass and have to leave it? So he bottled a case of it. He sent it to Atlanta to ask for permission. And they said, yeah, you can do it if you want to. It won't amount to anything, but if you want to do it, go ahead. <laughs> Little did they know, Yes, right? that's right. Because, of course, <laughs> what they saw were the soda fountains. And soda fountains were the thing of the day. That's where you went. To me, the, most, the, the coolest thing is the reproduction of the bottling works. And then we show you how... You had to fill the bottle, well, you had to wash the bottle first and then you had to fill the bottle. And that filling bottles was a dangerous occupation because if they blew up, you didn't want to get hurt. Yeah, like how thick is that glass? It's like what, a, like two, oh, three it's millimeters? it's even more than that and in, in, in parts of that bottle. It's very, very thick and the top of it has a very thick blob top. So obviously if you got the name blob top, you know it was a really thick top. <laughs> um, but the blob top and then it was sealed with a rubber stopper with a wire that went into it and pushed it down in there. Tradition holds that when you pulled that stopper out, it made a really loud popping noise and that's where we get soda pop from. So you have so many really cool pieces here. Do you have any ones that are your personal favorite? My favorite things are the, the little miniature um, uh, dispensers, you know, as, as in, you know, Coke bottle dispensers. Because if you were a salesperson going to, you know, someone to say, okay, well, this is a great um, bottle dispenser, you know, you couldn't take it with you. You couldn't take the big thing. So they made little tiny ones. And so we've got some of those. And then, of course, all the Santa Claus to me is, is fascinating as well. And um, it's fun. And it all started right here in Vicksburg, Mississippi, it's at least the bottling part. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Well, I just heard the scene. I heard that you know more about this place than anybody else who works here. Why is that? Because I've been here the longest. <laughs> how, how long you been working here? I've been working here 38 years. <laughs> It's a long time. What have you seen? What, what can you tell me about this place? Oh my God. What have I seen? Or what haven't I seen? How about a little bit of both? <laughs> <laughs> I have seen them come and go. The first owner was Kim Ferris. She owned it and she sold to Joyce about 20 some years ago. Joyce asked me would I stay on with her. So. There you are. Here I am. I was told that your uh, fried chicken has won awards. It has. And you know what? People think we do a big deal to that fried chicken, but the fried chicken is only washed, seasoned with red pepper and salt and put in the flour and drop it in the deep fat fry. So I'm guessing the, uh, the actual secret to it is it's fresh. Right. So what can you tell me about the Walnut Hills restaurant itself? Like, how long has this restaurant been here? This restaurant been here 38 years. So what was this place before it was, before it was a restaurant? It was a house. People lived, a lady lived here. She loved the glazed carrots we fixed, and she would call and order glazed carrots. But I'm gonna tell you a little secret. When we first started in this restaurant here, I came to work one morning, I got out right down there, and I was gonna walk up the hill. So I saw this lady in this blue evening dress standing in this one right here. I, come back, I came back down to look to see where she still there. Where she was, but by the time I got inside, she had gone. Oh, you saw a ghost. But she's a friendly ghost. She was so pretty. She was a pretty lady. She was beautiful. 
What would you say to somebody who's interested in checking out this place? Oh, well, I tell them to come on. This is one of the places you should visit before you leave this world. <laughs> that's that's, great. that's all the thing I can tell you. It's one of the places you should visit. You should come to Walnut Hills, and you won't be unhappy. You will be happy when you leave. Cheers to that. All right, then. Oh. Vicksburg is a truly historical town, and you learn something new every time you go there. I highly recommend that you check it out. Well, that's it for this week. But if you know of any places that are off the highway, send me a line. Who knows? Maybe I'll be off the highway next time in your hometown. Until then, take care. <laughs> He's right. There really is a lot of history in Vicksburg. That's right. And that food at Walnut Hills looks pretty tasty, too. It really does. <laughs> Got to go there. And uh, speaking of tasty, hard to believe it is Thanksgiving already. We have a delicious story for you. This time of year, of course, pumpkins are a big part of the holiday tradition. But there's a lot more of those big orange globes than you might think. And not all of them are orange. We are headed to Morton, Illinois, the pumpkin capital of the world. There, the land of Lincoln is clobbering second place California by almost half a billion pounds. It's classic Americana just in time for Thanksgiving. Next time on Farm Week, I hope you'll join us. And remember, if you ever miss a story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week on our website. That's farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.